Let's bless him. Let's bless him. Bless him. Him. He deserves the glory. He deserves the honor and the praise. Father, we thank you. You know, I was looking at that verse of scripture. Put that scripture y'all had behind her up there. Look at that. Let's read that together. Come on. Ready? Y'all read it together. For as many are, wait, I'm sorry, I messed it up. Start over. For as many as are the promises of God, they all find their answer in him, Christ. For this reason, we also utter, amen, so be it to God. What does that mean? It means that every promise, everything that God has, all of those promises that God has made, God is saying, yes, you can have them. He's saying, yes, you can have them. And then he's saying, all you have to do is say, so be it, God. So be it. I thought that would have blessed you. Y'all didn't get it. Only a handful of y'all. Every promise that God has given you, he's saying yes. Everything you desire, he's saying yes. You want to be healed? Yes. You want your bills paid? Yes. You want your family restored? Yes. You want deliverance in your life? Yes. You want your bank account full? He said all the promises of God are yes and amen. And so we say, so be it. Glory to God. Come on, let's thank him. So be it today, Father. So be it today. Today I say, so be it. Today I say, my body is healed. Today I say that my mind has been renewed. Today I say that every need in my life is met. So be it. Thank you, Father. Praise the Lord. Well, thank God for the word of God and thank God for the worship. That was amazing. Thank you so much. This morning, we have some guests with us. You know, Felicia's not a guest. Felicia's on loan to somebody else's church. She thinks she's gone, but she's just on loan to somebody else's church. She belongs to World Outreach Center. But today, we have a special guest, Pastor Paris Hibbler from Crossover Church. He is the pastor crossover church and when I called him and said that we didn't have a musician today because ours is traveling he was like I'm there and so we just thank God for him he's all right too ain't he he can play a little bit well this morning we just thank God there's just so many things that we can give God praise and glory for one of which is that my baby girl Toria who had two brain surgeries is in the house where you at, baby? Where you at, Toria? Where you at, Tori? Where she at? Where is she? You need to come here, so because they've been praying for you. They've been believing God for you. You need to come on here, darling. Let them see you. Come on, Toria. Come on, let's thank God. Thank God. Thank God. Father, we thank you. Hallelujah. Thank Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Father. This is what this is what healing looks like. This is what healing looks like. This is what it looks like when you use your faith and you believe God to raise you up and then you have a body of people praying and believing with you. Come on. She's in a place of recovery. Come on. Come on. Here she is. Thank you, Father. Father, we thank you. Thank you that you're strengthening her body today. Come on, stretch your hands out toward her. Thank you that you're strengthening her body today. You're giving her back everything that the enemy tried to take from her. 
She's completely healed, completely restored in the name of Jesus. And as we prayed for her before she went into surgery, now we pray for her post-surgery. And we continue to thank you. We continue to praise you, Father, that the work is being done in this body in the name of Jesus. And we thank you now, Father, in Jesus' name. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Father. Now, there's a little bit more business that we need you all to link up with us. We're believing God. Jordan had, Pastor Giles and Pastor Dana's son, Jordan, had to have surgery on his thyroid. They had to remove three of the four uh, because his kidney is not functioning the way that it needs to function. And Jordan needs a new kidney. And, you know, some of you may remember that Pastor Dana gave him her kidney. But we're believing God for another kidney, and this is it. This is it now. And so he had surgery on Thursday to prepare him for a kidney transplant. How many of you in here know somebody who needs a kidney? Let's just get them all. Come on. Come on. Let's just get them all. Let's use our faith and get everybody's kidney. Grab hands with your neighbor. Come on. Now, this work is not done naturally. It's done supernaturally. And now, you know, what I love about God is that he does not stop at kidneys. He'll move that thing over to removing cancer out of your pancreas, cancer out of your prostate, cancer out of your body, and any other sickness or disease. Let me tell you what he said. The Bible says, God said, bless the Lord, O oh my soul, forget not all of his benefits, who forgives all of your iniquities and heal it, say heal it, all, oh, say all, oh, your diseases. That's a promise that we're holding on to now. Then the word tells us in 1 Peter 2 and 24, and as Isaiah 53, that by the stripes of Jesus, by the stripes that are currently on his back right now, you and I were healed. Not going to be we are right now. We are healed. Give me another one. The Bible says that the son of righteousness will arise with healing in his wings. Another verse of scripture, the Bible says that he sent forth his word and healed them from all of their diseases. Do we have enough word to stand on? We've got enough of the word to stand on. Now let's petition God. Father, in the name of Jesus, we come to you based on the words that you spoke to us. We wouldn't even believe these things had you not said it. But because you spoke it, because you decreed it, because you declared it, we have a right to accept it and to appropriate everything that you've spoken. Father, today you said that healing is the children's bread. And so we thank you that we are your children. And so right now, angels of God, first and foremost, we rebuke the devil. And we command the enemy to take his hands off of the bodies of the believers. Secondly, we send out the angels of God to bring in the things that are necessary. And now, Holy Spirit, we look to you to bring about the manifestation of the gifts. Oh, yeah. The working of miracles, special faith and gifts of healing now come into operation. Thank you for Jordan's kidney. We claim it now in the name of Jesus and every person that we're believing for, for their kidney. Come on, reach up. We claim it now in the name of Jesus. we believe. We don't say because we're trying to believe. 
But right now, I see Jordan in the hospital with a brand new kidney. Glory to God. Glory to God. I see it. And Father, now every person that may be in this room and cancer is in their body. Oh, in this anointing to heal. Right now, we get up under the spout of the healing anointing. And I'm telling you, that anointing will heal whatever's in your body. So right now, if you have eye problems, back problems, leg problems, knee problems, cell problems, nerve problems, in the name of Jesus, we receive the manifestation of healing in our bodies now in the name of Jesus. Father, we grab it. We grab it. We say it's ours. We appropriate every blessing that you have given us. And we thank you now. Because I believe, say it with me, say I believe, I receive now. Now let's thank God for it. Father, we thank you. Thank you. Thank you that it's so. Thank you for his kidney. And I'm going to remind you, I'm going to keep reminding you that we're standing and we're believing for it. And we give you glory and honor in the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. You can be seated. Glory to God. Thank you, Father. Woo! Bless you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Lord. See, we can't, we, we got to get to the place where we don't get comfortable with having sickness and disease in our midst when God gave us a promise. He gave us a promise of healing. And either we're going to walk in this thing to the fullest or we're not going to walk in it at all. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Jesus. Glory to God. Now, Father, we just thank you for the word of God. Thank you that the word is a lamp unto our feet and it's a light unto our path. And as we travel down the road to the word and to light and to illumination, God, it's got to be real to us. But we understand that the only way that it can be is if we use our faith. Faith makes tangible what I cannot see. And so, Father, I thank you that I don't even have to believe you for the faith. All I have to do is get in the word and faith will come. And so my part is to believe it when you bring faith to me. Your part is to bring faith to us. And so we thank you, Lord, that as we look at the word today, that you're going to pull back the covers. We're going to see. We're going to see today. And whatever you desire to speak in our heart, we're going to take it. And we're going to take it home and we're going to live it. And it's going to transform who we are. And so we thank you for this, Father. I'm so grateful. So grateful. That no matter what's going on in my life, that I can go to God and he can change it. No matter what may be going on in me, I can go to God and he will change it. It's something that the devil can do nothing about. ready for the word? Yes. All right, let's go. Thank you, Lord. You know, for the last couple of weeks, I've been talking for the last 10 weeks, Pastor Skip has been preparing for Keeping It 100, which is this coming weekend. <laughs> and he's been preparing for Keeping It 100 this weekend, and uh, so we uh, let him have the time off and so we've been teaching and the staff has been assisting me in teaching and we uh, we've been doing 11 or 10 weeks of talking about the Holy Spirit and hopefully some of you all have learned some things about him you've or you know you've reacquainted yourself with the Holy Spirit 
because it's important for us to do so. And so I want you to understand that everything that we've shared from the past couple of weeks up to today is a work that has to be done in your human spirit. And I've shared this on many occasions that many times what we're looking for is for God to be a reality in our flesh. We want God, we want to feel him, you know, and we think that he's in our emotions, you know. God is not in your emotions. He will move your emotions, but he's not in your emotions. He's not, in your, he's not in your body. He's in your spirit. And because God is in your spirit, that is where the work that he will do in your life is done. It's a working from the inner man out. And when we allow the Holy Spirit to do the work that he longs to do through us, it will literally change how we see things. We will see things through God's eye. Versus seeing them through our own natural carnal eyes. And I'm telling you that when you can see things through God's eyes, they look a whole lot better. They look so much better. You can go through situations and like Pastor Skip said, you don't fret about it because you're seeing things God's way. And you're not seeing them your way. Because my way, if I look at the circumstances, the, like the Bible says in the Old Covenant, that if you look at the clouds, if a farmer looks at the clouds, he won't plant his seed. Because he's being governed by what he sees versus by what he knows. If it's time to plant and he's more caught up with what's going on around him versus the season that he's in, he will miss an opportunity for growth and increase. Are you listening? And so it's important for us to understand that God is doing a work, but that work is on the inside of you. And sometimes, you know, people want us to change and they want that thing to be instant soup. That's not, you know, I've been like this 35 years and you want me to change in a year. It don't work like that. Transformation is a process. And when you understand that transformation is a process, you're not moved by what you don't see in my life. Amen. Amen. And so you've got to understand that this work that the Holy Spirit has been called to do in your life is a work that he's doing in your spirit, in the dwelling place. We're the house of God. The ark of the covenant of God, if you will. The ark of the covenant is what contain the word of God. And today you and I are the temple of God. We carry the presence and the spirit of God in us. How many of you know that? How many of you believe that? Amen. So it's important to understand because your natural, the natural process of the soul, which comprises your mind, you all know this, your will and your emotions, is to intellectualize the pro and process things so that it will make sense to you. It's got to make sense in my mind. And unfortunately, when we do this, we reason ourselves out of revelation because we're leaning more toward information. And Jesus never said that your life would be built on information. He said that he would build your life on revelation. But if you lean to your understanding, that's why the Bible says... Don't lean to your understanding. Why? Because your understanding will lead you down a path that's opposite of where God is. And so you want to lean to what's on the inside of you, the spirit of God who lives in you. Because he's got things that he wants to show you, reveal to you, and bring out of you that God has put on the inside of you. Does that bless you? When we mentally reason with the spiritual, instead of studying it out and accepting it as truth simply because it's the word of God, we will lean to our own understanding. If we fail to keep the focus on our spirits, looking for God's power and wisdom and revelation to flow from there, we'll be left again to our own way of thinking 
but they will be leaning to that to bring manifestation. If I'm leaning, if I'm looking to what's in here, then there's certain things that I'm looking to happen. It's got to be this way. It's got to happen that way. It's got to work this way. What is that? I'm leaning to my own understanding versus if I just step back. That's why you got to slow it down. We move too fast. You got to slow things down and back away from your life sometimes. You know, I was in it, you know, I've been teaching all weekend. And I was in this place this weekend in Rockford. And I was, a woman was ministering. And the Spirit of God leaned over to me and said, when I slip away. And when he said that to me, this book unfolded in my eyes of those times when God has called me to slip away. And I realize that my slipping away sometimes bothers people that I'm in relationship with because they don't understand why I have to slip away. And it has nothing to do with you, but people take it personal. They take it personal. But God was saying to me, you're going to have to write a book about this when I slip away, because there are times that I'm out here, I'm, hey, Calvin, hey, Maria, uh, hey, y'all, how y'all doing? But then there's other times when God is saying, I need you in my presence. I need you to come here and get along with me because there are things that I need to download in your life. Are y'all listening to me? And so he leaned over to me and said, when I slip away. What am I doing when I slip away? I'm getting alone so that I can, I, can, I, can, I can go in. I can go inside. Because this is where God lives. Remember I told you all that we were in a meeting with Kenneth Copeland. And in that meeting, we were all standing with our hands raised. And he stopped us and he said, wait a minute. He said, lift that right hand up. And so we had that right hand up. He said, now take that left hand. We took that left hand. He said, turn your right hand towards you. We did like this. He said, now put that left hand behind that right hand. He said, and bring it down. Because this is where he is. And something went off on the inside of me because my whole life I've been looking up to the hills from which cometh my help. My help is not coming from the hills. My help, my help is coming unless there's hills in me. My help is coming from within me where God lives. So you can't say no more, my, 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 I'm looking to the hills from which cometh my help. That was in the old covenant. We don't live under that covenant no more. We have a better covenant established upon better promises. He ain't on no hill nowhere. He's in you. We've got to focus on our spirits, looking for the power of God to flow from there. And if that doesn't make sense, if you're leaning to your understanding, you're going to struggle to embrace what God has for you, and you will forfeit many of the blessings that God has designed for you to have. You cannot receive spiritual truths with carnal reasoning. It's impossible. You cannot receive spiritual truths with carnal reasoning. You have to embrace things through your spirit. And that's why we have to slow down. That's why we teach in series in this church. That's why we don't run through a series. You've been talking about the Holy Spirit for 10 weeks? Yes. Why? Because you didn't get it the first week. Why? Because you didn't get it the third week. Why? Because you didn't get it the fourth week. And we're going to keep on teaching to give the Holy Spirit time to pull the covers back so that you can see everything that you need to see. And even when I'm done teaching on the Holy Spirit, there will still be things about him that you don't know anything about. Amen. And so you got to learn how to live out of your spirit how to be governed by your spirit. Your heart wants to embrace the blessings of God. But if we spend more time trying to intellectualize things, you are going to struggle with the spiritual. That's why people struggle to be healed. They can't get it. I can't, I can't get it. Catherine Kuhlman's, you know, who God moved mightily through her ministry, mightily through this woman's ministry. People were healed under her ministry, but then when she got sick, she didn't know how to use her own faith for healing. 
So God would supernaturally, she would have manifestations of the Spirit of God. And other people would be healed under her ministry. But when she got sick, she didn't know how to apply the word. See, it can't be mental ascension. It has to be a truth and a revelation in your heart. So when you say, I'm strong in the Lord and in the power of his might, that's not coming from here. That's coming from a revelation that you know that the strength of God is on the inside of you. I was thinking about this when I was thinking about how people come up to receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And you can see if you've ever led people into the baptism of the Holy Spirit, you can see, you know, that the Spirit of God will rest on them. The Bible said in the Old Covenant, with stammering lips, I will speak to these people. That's tongues. And he was prophesying about it in the Old Covenant. With stammering lips, I will speak to this people. And so here it's been prophesied for years. And then people come up to the altar because tongues is for this dispensation. You don't see anybody praying in tongues in the old covenant because it did not belong to them. It was something that came about when the Holy Spirit came to live inside of you and I. And so in the dispensation called grace that we live in with the dispensation of grace came speaking in other tongues. But it was prophesied. Be long before it ever happened under the old covenant. And so then when people want to step into that gifting or that grace that God has given to us, they want to step into it. You can see the anointing or the presence of God is sitting on them, but something's going on in their head. And there's a fight between their head and their obedience to what they're hearing in here. And so they're, and mentally there's this struggle that's going on on the inside of them. Do I yield to what I hear? Do I yield to what I hear? What do I yield to? And God is saying, learn, learn, learn how to pull out of your spirit. Learn how to pull everything that you have out of your spirit because that's where I've put all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge, the Bible says. It's in you. You don't lack anything. This is why you can go into a deserted place and turn it into a garden of Eden because the garden is in you. Amen. Let's go to 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse number 14. Look at this. But the natural man receiveth. Come on, look at it with me. But the natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God. For they are foolishness unto him. Neither can he know them. They're foolish to him and he cannot know them. Meaning that word know is he cannot come into intimacy with that truth. He cannot come into intimacy with spiritual things. Because they're foolish to him. Because they are spiritually discerned. Look at what the God's Word translation says. It says this, a person who isn't spiritual doesn't accept the teachings of God's Spirit. He thinks they're nonsense. He can't understand them because a person must be spiritual to evaluate them. So you have to let your spirit embrace when the Word is coming forth. And you're learning new truths and new things out of the word of God. So don't allow your mind to resist the truth when you see it housed in the word of God. To step into everything God has for us spiritually, it's going to take your faith and a responsiveness to the word and to the Holy Spirit. So don't let your mind or, or your past experience talk you out of anything that God says is yours. Don't let your mind... Or your current experience, you know, we all go through things and we're always saying to one another, think back. Think back. Ty Tribbett, if he did it before, he can do it again. What's the rest of it? Same God right now, same God back then. What does that mean? He has not changed. And you can't allow somebody else's experience to sway you into believing that the word of God is not accurate. 
You know, I was sharing with the first crowd, you know, we, you know, we get into spats with people because we're pastors and people have these unarticulated expectations. And then when we don't meet their expectations, they go and talk about us. You know, anybody that's a leader, you know what I'm talking about. So people will go and talk about us, and then they'll go and talk about us to somebody that, that hasn't had an experience with us. And so the people, then we encounter the people who have never had an experience with us, and they're looking at us sideways, and you wonder, what what I do to you? I don't even know you. And you got to add it, you bent with me, and I don't even know you. What's happened? You're, somebody else's negative influence has now influenced somebody else. You can't allow somebody else's ne negative experience to make you believe that what God said about you is not so. Amen. I tell you the story, you know, when my brother-in-law came down with lymphomic cancer and he was fighting for his life in a, in a hospital in Alabama and my sister and I flew there to be with him and we were by his bedside for almost two months. And we're in the hospital with him for two months, and for two months straight, we had the Word of God playing every day, all night, all day, all day, all night. I got the scripture, and we were working in shifts, but we never left that hospital. And somebody was always with him. We would go shower, come back, and we were there quoting the scriptures over his body, speaking the word over his body, saying what we needed to say over his body. When she got tired, I would pick it up, and I would be there speaking the word over his body. And August 26, 1996, he died. Threw me for an absolute loop. And I've shared with you all that when I was standing, there was a, a, like a cornfield connected to that hospital. And when I went out into the cornfield, he was still living the day before he passed away. I went out into that cornfield and I stood in that cornfield and I yelled to God so loud that six blocks away, somebody thought I was talking to them. I yelled out to God, what else do you want us to do? What else do you want from us? We've been speaking the word. We've been worshiping you. We've been saying what we needed to say. Why isn't he raised up? Went back into that hospital. The next day, he went home to be with the Lord. I made up in my mind for three years. I ain't praying for nobody else. I'm not going to visit nobody else. I ain't doing nothing else. But I was still working full time in the ministry. And so, you know, as people were coming in and they had ailments in their body, because it was my job, I still had to pray for people. And even though in my brokenness, me trying to figure out what was going on, how am I going to make sense of this? How am I ever going to believe God again? I never once shaped my mouth to say, now, nah, it didn't work for me. I don't know how, you know, it might, he might work for you, but it didn't, it, didn't, it didn't work for me. Why? Because I was not going to allow somebody else, wasn't going to try to influence somebody else's belief in the word of God. Amen. You can't let somebody else's experience or lack thereof. Cause you to think that everything that God said about you is not so. Whatever God said about you, that is, that's so. And if you didn't have that experience, I'm sorry. Maybe you didn't do something right. You know, like the man said, you know, somebody came to him and said, I tried that faith business and it didn't work. He said, no, faith tried you and you didn't work. See, that's the thing. Maybe faith tried you and you didn't work. And I'm going to share this because we had this conversation on Wednesday night. You know, when I would go to the Lord and I would talk to the Lord about this situation. Why did he die? What happened? I know I believed you. I know I was trusting you. And I believe with everything in me that my sister was believing God for her husband to be raised up. And his family was believing God. It's not the will of God to leave a young woman. She's in her 20s with a little baby boy. Jared wasn't even two with a little baby boy. That's not the will of God. How can this be? And I will never forget the scripture God showed me. He took me to the word of God that says the secret thing belongs to the Lord. Now, what does that mean? This is not my message, but I'm going here. 
He said, the secret thing belongs to the Lord. See, there are things that are going on in people's lives. God is speaking to people. The Holy Spirit is downloading things to people consistently, speaking in their spirits about different things. And we don't know it. You don't know it. You don't know what God is saying to people, but they know it. Whether they're obeying what God said to them or whether they're not obeying. Case in point, the Lord said to me, you're going to have to get off that sugar. You're going to have to let that sugar go. And I didn't realize that I was addicted to sugar until I got the instruction to let it go. And I kept eating the sugar. But the more I ate the sugar, the stronger the demand in me kept going. You better get off that sugar. You better get off that sugar. And then in 2016, my lung collapsed and I never connected it to the sugar. Because I don't smoke, I don't drink. You hear what I'm saying? And so what's happening? If I had died, and if I were to die, nobody knows, nobody sees me tipping and dipping and eating licorice when ain't nobody around. You don't see what I'm doing in private. There are things that only God knows that I'm doing. There are things that God, God is the only one that knows what you've been doing that he's been saying you need to stop that because that's not going to add to your quality of life. You need to stop that because one day down the road, that's going to cost you. You better stop that. And it's not because he's trying to stop you from living a successful life, but he knows the end from the beginning. And he knows what it's going to do in your body. Are y'all listening to me? And so here, if I had died or, or I had gotten sick, can't nobody tell me that the people in this church would not have rallied around and people from other places, y'all be on this altar praying and believing God and trusting God, but you don't understand that I did this to me. I did it to me because I refuse to listen to God, and this is not condemnation and judgment. What this is, is Galatians 5. If you sow to your flesh, you have no choice except to reap corruption. It's a law, and God will not violate that law. If you persist in doing things that God is in, in, your, in your spirit is saying, come away, come away, come away from that, get away from that. And you keep it going. And then you material, something happens in your body, and we're all trying to believe God for you? He said, the secret thing belongs to me. And when he said it, I said, God, then you're going to have to help me. Help me. And I went back, even in my heart, when in my heart I was struggling with it. I said, I still believe that you're here. I still believe that your word is true. I still believe that by the stripes of Jesus, I can be healed and people can be healed. The secret thing belongs to God. Oh, Jesus. You see, the manifestation of the spirit is yours. Every gift he has belongs to you. Every gift that God has given to the Holy Spirit is yours. But if you don't know that, you're going to live without those gifts. And they're in you. I'll tell you a story. When I, for my 40th birthday, somebody gave me a beautiful 12-piece china set. When I say beautiful, I mean beautiful. But I ate on paper plates and plastic plates. So when she gave me the china, I couldn't appreciate it. And so I had my husband take it in the basement. And that china sat in my basement for 11 years. And then we started our church, and one day I wanted to do a really nice dinner for our pastoral staff and, you know, the leaders and all of that. And I was about to go, you know, when the idea came, it's like, ooh, what's your table going to look like? You know, you're going you're gonna to have to, you got paper plates. I had a few, like three forks that matched and, you know, I didn't have, you know, I just didn't have anything. 
that, you know, I didn't care about my kids or my man eating on it, but and now I'm going to have some nice folks coming in, you know. <laughs> and so, you know, I wanted everything to be nice. And so I'm fretting just a little bit, and I'm getting ready to go buy some china. And the Spirit of God said to me, you got china downstairs in the basement. And so I was like, okay. Went in the basement, and in the back of my basement, had been sitting there for 11 years. I had to dust it off. There was cobwebs all around it. But I, you know, brought it out, put it on the table, you know, and then I had to call Pastor Dana over because she was raised eating on China. And so I called Pastor Dana over, and she came over, and she set the table for me. But I had it for 11 years and didn't know it. Didn't know it. And some of y'all have been saved for umpteen hundred years. And the Holy Ghost has been living in you for umpteen hundred years. And he's in you. He got cobwebs on him. He got dust on him. But he's in there. And he's in there with every gift God has given him for you, for your life. For you, for your life, so that you can be a blessing to other people. But if you live, and he's in, if, if he's in the basement of your life, if he's in the basement of your life, and you've forgotten that he's in there, you're going to be eating off of paper plates and plastic plates. Which represents the quality of your life. God wants us eating on China in life. You know, we're getting ready to start a new series, and it's called The Come Up. And we're talking about every area of your life coming up. And when it's over, you're not going to have the same testimony you had. We're talking about the come up. We're talking about coming up in every area. 1 Thessalonians 5 and 23, he said, Beloved, I want your whole spirit, whole, whole spirit, soul, body. I want you to be preserved blameless. He's saying, I want every part of who you are in the come up. Then in John, he said, beloved, I wish above all things. He, uh, all things? Every time I, I stumble on all things. Beloved, I wish above all. You wish this above everything? Come on now. Uh, uh, above everything, I want you to prosper. You want me to prosper above everything? Yeah. I want you to prosper and be in health even as your soul prospers. And even in that verse of scripture, if you study it out, you will be able to see man on three dimensions in there. He said, I, he said beloved, I want thou, that's your spirit, to prosper. I want you to be in health, your body, even as your soul prospers. Three things he talked about. I want your spirit to prosper. I want your mind, your soul, your emotions to prosper, and I want you to be in health. Every part of you needs to be in the come up. Every part of you needs to be where God wants it to be, and no part of you can be left out. You don't want sickness in your body and a lot of money in the bank. You don't want to be spiritually strong but mentally and emotionally weak. Everybody got to come up. This church has got to come up. We got to bring order even to this church. Everything is in the come up. But it starts with you and me realizing where is it that God wants me to be. And once you get a revelation and you start identifying with where it is that God wants you to be, nothing should pull you off your square. But things are going to come to pull you off your square. Prepare yourself for that. Don't get hung up because you're going through something. No, come on. This is another notch in my belt. Come on. We got to do this. And you got to learn to suffer well. You got to learn to go through situations with your chest out. This is what 
what God is calling us to. He's calling us to live life the way he created. You've been seated in heavenly places with Christ. On Wednesday night, Wednesday, Wendy shared the revelation. She said, sometimes the problem is, is that when we're talking to God, we're talking to God from the earth when you've been seated on the throne. And we got to learn to talk to God from where we've been seated. When we first started the church, Pastor Tim got up one time. He said it one time, and it went through us like a, a f- electricity. And he said, a rising tide lift everybody's boat. <laughs> and we were like, yeah, a rising tide lifts everybody's boat. Amen. Billy D. Williams told Diana Ross one thing, one time. He says, success is nothing if you don't have somebody you love to share it with. See, we're not trying to grow. We're not trying to create this gulf between Skip and Melva, and then there's the people. That's garbage. We want the gospel to be in manifestation in every single life in this room, from the 10-year-olds to the 50-year-olds to the 60-year-olds to the 70-year-olds to the 80-year-olds. The come-up should be real for all of us, but if you don't let us get the word in you, if you don't let us get the word in you, got to come up in your church attendance, I'm sorry. I'm saying it. Now I'm getting ready to be the pastor. I'm going to say it. I'm going to say it. There is no reason in the world that we start service at 8 o'clock and y'all mosey in at 8.30. There's no reason. And then we give you another chance. We let you come in at 9.30 and you mosey in at 10 o'clock. No, no, no. Listen to me. Listen to me. Timeliness is an integrity issue. It's an integrity issue. When you can't be on time at work, when you can't be on time for church, you have an integrity issue. And you got something you need to be working on. That in you needs to come up. Amen. 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 Tell me you love me. I'm helping you. I'm helping you. You're talking about living from the inside out. I made up my mind when I go to the grocery store. I'm not going to be, and I don't mean no harm, I love y'all, but I'm not going to be that idiot that takes their cart and just when they get their groceries out, they just push the cart. And you don't care about nobody else's car. You rolling it up on some, some grass heap versus taking it back to where it needs to be. Stop that. Stop that. That's not God's way. We're talking about coming up. You got to come up in your life. And it's the small things that you got to pay attention to. Oh, yes, you do. You got to pay attention to the little things. I used to make my bed and make half my bed and fall asleep. Half the bed. And then the bed would stay messy for the rest of the day. And I made up my mind, I'm coming up in this area. So now I get up, first thing I do, after I done talked to Jesus, is I make that bed. And Pastor Skip would look at me as I would be making the bed, and I'd be like, no, Joker, get that other side. We're going to make this bed. And so now every day we get out of the bed, and we're making the bed together. Why? Because we need to come up. The church for too long, we've just been floating around on these spiritual beds and, you know, in this glory cloud. Come in the church, your house is a mess, your garage is a mess, your car is a mess. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. We talking about coming up. We coming up. 
Clean your house. You want the peace of God in your house? Clean it. Anytime my house is a mess, I can't even hear God. I told one day I came in and Pastor Skip, you know, he had all of this stuff. I'm like, I can't, I can't hear God, see God, or even smell God in this room. He said he's not the author of confusion. He does not dwell in confusion. Listen, listen, and I'm going to close with this. On Wednesday night, Pastor Tim brought out, maybe it was Wednesday, I don't know, one day he was talking, and maybe I was listening to him online. And he was talking about loving your neighbor. He said, the problem is, the Bible, we got the two commandments. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and love your neighbor like you love yourself. He said, the problem is, is that you don't love yourself. That's why you struggle to love your neighbor, because you don't love your, you don't have a problem. We don't have a problem loving, oh, God, I love you, God, I love you, I love you. But he said the next one is love yourself. And you don't love yourself. If you loved yourself, you wouldn't do to yourself what you do. Hear me. I started taking care of my teeth, flossing multiple times a day because I have to love my teeth. Amen. Look, I know this ain't no son. You ain't going to shout on this. You ain't going to shout on this. You ain't going to shout. But I told you, God told us, your job is to make them fruitful. God told, when he created Adam, the first thing he said to him, you be fruitful, you multiply, you replenish, and you subdue. Some of us grew up, you know, you may have grown up, you didn't have your parents or whatever. And so practical things you didn't learn. That's all right, it ain't too late. Go to somebody. Ask somebody. How you do that? I'll never forget, and I'm sitting down with this. Pamela Hines would talk about cleaning her house. And at that time, I had small children, so keeping my house clean was a struggle. But she started talking about, you know, cleaning the shower. And she said, while you in the shower, clean the shower. I was like, hello. <laughs> while you in the shower, clean the shower. Got that. Then my, my, grandfa my great-grandfather told me, now when you wash the dishes, you wash the cups and glasses first. Then you move your way to the bowls, and then you move your way to the, the, the plates. Then you do your silverware, and you do your pots and pans last. No, what we do, we throw everything. The fried chicken pot, everything is in there with the... With Talking about coming up. Come on, you got to come up. We got to come up. And to come up, it means that the small things. See, the Bible says it's the little foxes that spoil your vine. It's the little things in your life that you're not paying attention to that have the potential to stop you from being the great person that you desire to be. It's little things. Some of y'all wonder, why can't I get this or why can't I get that? Because you keep sowing the wrong seeds. You keep sowing, if you keep sowing late seeds, that is going to produce something in your life. And you have to ask yourself, because every day all you're doing is sowing seeds. Right now, I'm sowing seeds. That's all I'm doing. Right now, I'm sowing seeds. And throughout the day, everything I do, I'm going to sow a seed. I text Calvin and Maria and said, come sit up here. I sowed a seed. Everything you do is sowing a seed. What you want to do is make sure that the seeds that you're sowing are going to produce a harvest that you will welcome down the years. Come on, let's stand up. I'm sorry if I fussed. <laughs> Sometimes the shepherd in me will come out and you know, it's like, you know, you ever seen a shepherd? And I don't mean any harm. I don't mean this towards you all. But sheep are the dumbest animals God ever made. Do you know that? I don't mean that to y'all. But the Bible did call y'all the sheep of his pasture. But I don't mean that to y'all. Me too. 
But sheep are the dumbest animals God ever made. They can't even have their own babies without the assistance of man. And what a good shepherd will do is he will keep bringing the sheep into the fold, keep bringing them into the fold, keep giving them what they need so that they can grow. And if you're in this place, and I'm saying this, the Spirit of God just said this on the inside of me. If you're in this place and you're at World Outreach Center and you view Skip and Melba as your pastors, you're going to have to come up. You're going to have to come up. Make up your mind that you're going to do things the way that God wants them done in your life. And that you're going to allow the Holy Spirit to live his life through you. Amen. Father, we just thank you today with every head bowed and every eye closed. If you're in this room today, you can't come up the way God wants you to come up without knowing who he is. And so if you're in this room today and you've not made Jesus the Lord and Savior of your life, I want to encourage you to come down to this altar and let me pray with you and lead you into a relationship that will forever change your life. And so if you're here this morning and you have not made Jesus the Lord of your life, I want you to raise your hand. If Jesus is not the Lord of your life, raise your hand. Here's another category. If you're in this room and you've kind of gotten away, you're still a believer. If you were to die, you would be going to heaven. But you've stepped away from your relationship with the Father and you want to rekindle that relationship, raise your hand. I want to see who you are. I see you. I see you. I see you. I see you. Now, here's the thing. Wherever you bow your heart, that's where the altar becomes. And so I'm not going to call you up here because I think that we become legalistic in, in, in even doing altar calls. And so where you are right now, I want you to have a conversation because there's a few of you all out here. I want you to have a conversation with God about where you are in your life. And you say to him what you're going to do because I can lead you into that, but it may not be what your heart is saying. And so what you want is your heart to be articulated to the Father. And so for just a moment, I want everybody in the room, all of you, talk to God. If you're in this room and you've been struggling with fear, anxiety, cast that on to the Lord. Let him deal with that right now in this moment. Talk to him about what your concerns are. If you haven't been trusting him, talk to him about it. If you haven't committed a situation to him, talk to him about it. And if you just want to worship him, you can do that as well. Father, we thank you. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Father. And now with every hand raised, Father, you said that it was your desire that we would be fruitful and multiply. And in Genesis, you made it clear. We understand from the law of first mention that the first time you say something is what you desire. And so it's your desire that we are fruitful, that we multiply, that we replenish and we subdue. And so, Father, thank you that we are going to come up in every area of our life. And those of us that think we got it together, we're coming up even more. We're going to be stronger, wiser, better. Thank you, Father. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray and we thank you, Father. Amen. Amen. Come on, let's thank God. Thank you, Lord.